welcome to the 2019 Forum News Service Legislative Briefing. We're so thrilled you could all be here. Um, I'd like to welcome all of our panelists today. Thank you for making the time for us uh, this goodness. This morning, we have at the center, Governor Tim Walls, thank you for making it, as well as Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka, House Speaker Melissa Hortman, Senate Minority Leader Tom Bach, House Minority Leader Kurt Doubt, and of course, we have a panel of reporters up here. We're going to be asking you some questions. Um, we're going to go one at a time. If there are follow-ups, we're going to allow for that. We want to make sure you all get to answer the questions as well as you can. Um, if anyone else is implicated in an answer, we'd like to give them a chance to respond as well. Um, I'd also really like to thank the Senate Sergeant at Arms Office for helping us with this, as well as Senate Media Services. Um, and without further ado, let's get going. Um, so last week we heard Senator Gazelka talk about early wins that he would like to see. Um, I was hoping that you all could talk about some of those early wins. What would you like to accomplish and when can we expect that to get done? Who's first? They use your Senator name. Gazelka, you can go first. <laughs> so the, the benefit of early wins is we can uh, build some momentum, which is really important in this process. Uh, at the end, it uh, becomes pretty difficult. Uh, so if you have built some relationship, you built some trust, uh, that's really important. So early wins help do that. Uh, certainly the election money is a, one of the areas that we talked about. Uh, I've talked to a number of our chairs about uh, parts of different bills, uh, and if they can find the chair on the other side, uh, the, the House in this case, uh, and find places of agreement uh, where they can do that. There's no reason we could, can't do it early. But as far as early goes, you know, that's uh, it can be January or February. Any, anything in there, I would consider early, uh, considering that normally bills go through a whole long process to get there. Well, I would certainly just uh, echo that, that I think that is uh, the right thing to do. If we, if we heard anything over the last uh, year, it was that Minnesotans want to see us work together to find common ground. Uh, they don't expect us to agree on everything. Uh, I do think that there's, especially, and uh, we all in this room understand this conversation, this healthy conversation is taking place against the backdrop of the longest government, federal government shutdown in history. And I think now more than ever, listening to the tone, and I know especially uh, Leader Gazelka and, and Speaker Hortman ha have talked about being very deliberate, being very deliberate in, in dates and gates that we need to pass through together. And some of these early wins, I think, they build momentum. Success builds success. And so we are committed. Uh, I certainly think the legislature needs to work and do their work together. We'd like to see some of those things we agree on move together. I think the election money is certainly a common one. That that seems like one that would be a, a pretty logical start. And if there's a few more in there that are priorities for the public that we all share the values on, on, on elder abuse issues, on opioid uh, things that we can take as we get deeper moving towards the budget. So I, uh, I'd just like to echo that sentiment. Early wins matter. They're the way governments should work. I think uh, the timeline of how the Senate and the House work uh, certainly might not be tomorrow, but uh, if we get those before we start hitting some of those budget gates and some of the bigger priority, it'll, it'll build momentum. So I certainly applaud that effort. Minnesotans are hardworking people and they deserve a hardworking legislature. They deserve for us to get going right away. Definitely on a lot of areas, there was considerable work done last session and we just didn't get the bills across the finish line and signed into law which is a critical part of the lawmaking process, right? The, the lawmaking process is not a process of passing bills, it's a process of getting bills signed into law. So there were a number of pieces of the 990-page omnibus bill that were very technical, that were agreed to by both sides. We're hoping some of that can move through. I really appreciate Senator Gazelka's focus on the HAVA money. That's a very logical, kind of no-brainer that we could move fast on. I think distracted driving, you'll see later today, uh, Representative Frank Hornstein, Senator... Newman having a press conference on um, an agreement that they've discussed, and we'll see how fast we can move that. Uh, the opioid crisis, you know, we had a bill that moved through the Minnesota Senate last year. I believe the vote was 62 to 5. It wasn't heard on the House floor. I think uh, Representative Liz Olson and uh, State Representative Dave Baker are working very well together, and I expect we'll be moving quickly on that. Um, but, and I have a little piece, a little tiny piece that was in the 990-page Omnibus Prime 
that simply uh, removes a defense to rape that you're married. Uh, right now, under Minnesota state law, if you get your wife drunk or um, intoxicated by some other chemical and then you rape her, you have a perfect defense to that crime, which is she, she was uh, uh, under the influence of something and we're married. And that's obviously we can all agree that's something we need to get out of state law. And uh, Carla Bigham will be carrying the bill in the Senate, and Zach Stevenson will be carrying the bill in the House. And so f hopefully that one would be one for example of what came out of the 990 page bill that we can move quickly on. Well, uh, don't mean to start by sounding a little nostalgic, but uh, I think I paid my dues here long enough. Maybe people give me uh, a, a little time to do that. I mean, it appears to me, and I think it probably appears to most members of the public, uh, to the governor's point, uh, our government in Washington, D.C. is badly broken. And, you know, it, uh, in today's uh, media market, with everything coming at people, it seems like the federal news stories team, seem to drive uh, the evening news uh, in the minds of people. And so I think it's going to take a lot of effort on our part to show Minnesotans that, no, uh, the federal government in D.C. might be broke, but your government at the state capitol in St. Paul still works. And I think that's really, really important. And uh, so if we can find some things that uh, uh, were vetted last year, it's much easier in the Senate than the House. Uh, I mean, this, in the Senate, uh, there's nobody right now today, I guess, that, that uh, didn't participate in the conversation and take votes on those issues that were vetoed last year, specifically the opioid abuse issue, the elder abuse issue, uh, the safe school issues. A uh, lot of time was spent on that last year. A little more difficult in the House with 39 brand new members to kind of bring up the speed with uh, hearings on the bills and the public testimony uh, on them. But uh, I just would say uh, to the two leaders that are going to make those decisions, as you go through that, try not to do things that have ongoing spending tails. I think we just don't know in this period of uncertainty. I think it's a little risky to start doing things, even if we both agree, uh, that have impacts on not only this budget cycle, but the next one. It's a little bit early to do that, I think, until we see uh, the next budget forecast. I think if there's some one-time things, uh, we've got a, quite a bit of one-time money. That's not going to go anywhere. If there's some one-time things that there's, there's good agreement on, I think it's worth getting, uh, the more we can get done early, the better. You know, I'm fairly optimistic. I know the press sometimes likes to report on our differences uh, because that makes a better story. But uh, if you if you listen to where uh, everybody has been talking about the same things, I think there's a lot of common ground and a lot of work that we can get accomplished uh, quickly. Everybody was talking about reducing health care costs. Everybody was talking about funding roads and bridges um, and a lot of other things. And, and I think uh, if we focus on some of those things and focus on them early, I think that'll help us uh, build a good working relationship and we'll get some stuff done. Uh, Mary LaHammer, Twin Cities Public Television. I noticed tax conformity was not a part of any of those lists. At one point, there was a lot of momentum to move quickly in the session. Talk about why that would not be part of an early win and what you want to communicate to voters, taxpaying Minnesotans who will start filling out their taxes soon. I always look to the former tax chair to lead the conversation on this because he usually has quite a bit to say on taxes. <laughs> I'll, uh, I, I guess I'll start. You know, a year ago, there was a lot of interest around this issue because it appeared like uh, Minnesotans that were now going to file short form on their federal because of the tax uh, changes would not be able to itemize in Minnesota any longer. So there were going to be significant tax increases on Minnesotans because people who normally would have itemized weren't going to be allowed to anymore. As a result of the Department of Revenue finding uh, the Supreme Court decision from 1971, the Wallace decision, uh, that uh, uh, the interpretation is the state can set its own tax policy, the federal government can't set it. So the fact that uh, people are now going to be able to itemize on the Minnesota returns, even if they short form, uh, short form federally, uh, I think has taken some of the wind and some of the urgency out of the conformity issue. So I think we've got some time on that. The hard part is, and I didn't see anything come forward last year that I could support, and I'm not being critical, it's very difficult. You know, if, you, if we were to do all of this federal conformity, it's going to raise taxes in Minnesota by about six, a little north of $600 million. Yeah. The question is, how can you tailor a tax relief package as a part of it that gives the money back to the people that uh, were impacted by conformity that ended up 
paying more taxes. And that's pretty complicated. It's pretty easy to give $600 million away in a tax bill, but I think to the extent uh, we can give it back to the people that were negatively impacted by the federal changes, that's pretty complicated, but I would argue pretty important. Let me uh, take it next, too, because uh, uh, Tom and I both serve on the tax committee, even you know, though we're not the tax chair. But uh, uh, I, we missed the window for tax conformity for this year. Uh, I'm surprised that Minnesota Revenue somehow then could do some of the things that they ended up doing, but that's another story. Uh, but I do want, so I, it's one of our top five that we talked about that we need to do tax conformity. Uh, but when we do it, I want to make sure it's right. And uh, I do agree with Senator Bach in that we don't want to raise taxes through tax conformity. Uh, and that's the tricky part of all of this. And so um, I'll, I'll be patient. You know, originally I hoped we could de get it done in January, but uh, talking to my tax chair, he'd rather take a little bit more time and make sure we get it done right. But it is in our top five. You know, I think this is a, an important issue and something we should deal with right away. I've been pretty vocal about that. Um, I, you know, it, it's easy to say that our revenue department will just allow people to itemize, um, but that was really easy when you itemized on your federal return and then you just took those numbers and put them on your state return. Um, now they're not going to be on your federal return. Um, this isn't going to be an easy process, regardless of what anybody's saying. I haven't heard revenue say that they're ready for this. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to, to be reassured that they are. Um, I think we've got an opportunity to show Minnesotans uh, right out of the chute that, that this is something we can work on together. We can get it done early, and, and, and when we do it, we can make it retroactive. I understand that we're not going to have it ready for uh, the, the turbo taxes of the world to uh, have their software ready for this filing period, but... Um, I think we at least need to pass the bill, make it retroactive so that folks, if they need to file a, an amendment to their return, uh, can do that. But as they go through this process, I think, the, I think the bill should be passed and ready so they know what they're doing and know what they're going into. Um, and I think that sort of certainty for not just you know Minnesotans, but our small businesses and uh, folks that, that kind of need to know how all of these things interact with each other and, and have that certainty. I think we owe it to them to do that. So I think it should be priority one, and I think we should still do it in January. Well, I think it's important for Minnesota taxpayers to know we won't disrupt the 2018 filing season. The work that the Minnesota Department of Revenue has done means that Minnesotans can file their taxes uh, for, for the wages earned in 2018 on the normal timeline here in 2019. And we will definitely take a look at conformity. And if we're able to do something, and in some cases for some filers, it may make sense to file an amended return. And I might be able to, um, to, to take advantage of some changes that we make in conformity. But when we look at conformity at the federal level and then what it means in state law, we have to look at how the uh, burdens and benefits were distributed at the federal level and then look at doing some justice and providing fairness here at the Minnesota level so those folks who didn't get a big tax cut from the federal action see a little bit more uh, in the way of tax cuts in Minnesota. An example is Minnesota corporations got a bigger tax cut from the federal bill than the total num amount of taxes that they pay in the state of Minnesota. Individuals didn't do as well. So as we look at justice and fairness in the tax code and we look at tax conformity, I think there's an opportunity to do something for Minnesotans hardworking families. Can I jump in there, Madam Speaker? You said you may do something, and earlier we heard some of the senators talking about that Minnesotans are disproportionately affected. So <clears throat> does may turn into a must, especially looking at how Minnesota gets hurt by this? Well, I expected Senator Bach to talk about the case of Wallace versus State of Minnesota, where the Minnesota Department of Revenue <laughs> figured out that the bad impacts we thought would happen to Minnesota filers during this time period won't be happening. So the sort of really negative impacts that we were worried about last session because of the case Wallace versus the State of Minnesota and the innovative work that the Department of Revenue has done since we left session at the end of May until now means that Minnesotans don't have to worry about getting hard hit from what was done in Washington, D.C. I would build on some of what the speaker said. It's uh, the unique position I'm in that I was part of that debate at the federal level, and it's no secret that I disagreed with the final product that, that came out. Um, but I also recognize that is the product that, that we're dealing with. Uh, states like Minnesota, that I believe invested wisely, had good policy, were disproportionately hit by this, salt and everything else that went with it. With that being said, um, I think good governance, and what you hear 
all of us talking about is warrants that this is just something that there should be an expectation we get done. I don't think this is uh, uh, the five alarm fire, but I think that the expectation to get it done during this session is not that unreasonable. Uh, Representative Dowd is right. It's not going to be as easy because there are tax debates in here that are healthy and good for us that there's significant differences on where we believe those uh, those revenue breaks or those revenue uh, relief should go. Um, but we can get that done. I think it's important that we do reassure. I'd, I'd reassure uh, Representative Doubt our revenue department is ready. They will be ready. I think, again, you have every right to wait and see, but I think we have laid out that this is going to be a deliberate administration that is going to be as transparent as possible to work together to be there, and your expectation is they should be there. So Minnesotans will be able to file this year, um, and, and that's a good thing. So it's not the immediate sense of urgency, but I would just, from our perspective in the administration, this just makes sense for a state that works in good governance to have this in place to allow our tax preparers and, and families and businesses to have some predictability um, as soon as we possibly can. And, and whether that's in uh, March, April, or May, uh, I think that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Patricia Lopez, um, Star Tribune. Uh, Governor Walls earlier had suggested that there might be uh, a way or a need for the state to mitigate the impacts of the federal shutdown. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you're considering now that we're entering, you know, the fourth week? Well, if I could, and and I. I guess this is a, a press preview for you. We'll be holding a, a press conference tomorrow. My team worked throughout the weekend and, and has been since, uh, since we took office to prepare what the impacts are to Minnesota and what the potential courses of action are to make sure that we are mitigating that impact, especially on the most vulnerable, but again, trying to provide some certainty across all of the affected uh, areas because of the federal government shutdown. We'd like to be able to lay out a pretty uh, specific plan, and some of that will include, and again, not springing anything on these folks, uh, we'll be working this afternoon because there will be things that, that potentially could take uh, from the appropriation process. Uh, legislative action and, and get them working together. My hope is that tomorrow uh, you may be able to be see all of us together standing there and with uh, a plan and with the commissions going forward because this is serious. It's, it's about a billion dollars a month. Obviously not all that's affected because it's not a full government shutdown um, and it ranges a whole gamut of, of things that, that impact the state and we need to start thinking about how to best put that in place because uh, again the dysfunction of of the federal government, uh, I said it on last Monday that if they're not going to lead on this, we will. And I think collectively together, uh, these five up here would be willing to do that. So there'll be more information coming tomorrow, and, and I think it's very important that we have a strategic plan to do that. Our team met with uh, Commissioner Franz Friday afternoon, Majority, Winkler, Majority Leader Winkler and I. And uh, I know Commissioner Franz is testifying in the Ways and Means Committee, even as we speak. That's right. And um, I'll be having a meeting with Lyndon Carlson later today to talk about what we need to be ready to do in the Minnesota House. Well, I'll just make a comment that uh, certainly we will listen. I, I'm not aware of uh, some of the proposals, but uh, I don't think anybody wins in a shutdown. Uh, it's typically a, a lot of pain. Uh, we've been through a few in Minnesota, and so whatever you can do to find a way through is important. And so. Uh, we'll, we'll listen to Governor Walsh's proposals and you know, go from there. Uh, I heard something really remarkable Friday at the Twin West Breakfast, um, Leader Doubt. You were talking about boycotting municipalities that, uh, or even urging businesses to move out of cities if they uh, pass local ordinances for such things as minimum wage and uh, paid leave. I didn't hear any reaction from the other panelists there. Uh, Senator Bach, you were there, Leader Hortman, you, or Speaker Hortman, forgive me, you were there. I'd like to hear your response to that. Uh, and Governor Wells, too, uh, uh, I, I'd like to find out, you said you weren't kidding. I want to verify that now. Were you kidding or you, were you serious? And what is your response to that? I don't, you know, I don't think Minnesota businesses need me to tell them what to do or not to do. I think they'll figure that out on their own. I, you know, I think we're seeing, when you go to McDonald's now, uh, and I've done it a few times at the airport and other places, uh, you, you place your order at a screen. Um, and, you know, the, the businesses will figure out how to, to run their business in a way that can, can keep them profitable um, and, and allow them to still serve their customers. And, and if it becomes difficult, 
they won't do business in, in cities that uh, have policies that are too uh, burdensome. Um, that's just the reality. That's the free market. Um, so my saying that had had nothing more to do with uh, you know than than just the reality of businesses will make those decisions. And I and and frankly they should. And and cities that uh, that make it too burdensome to do business in their city um, will eventually suffer the consequences of that. And they shouldn't be surprised if that happens. I think it's important that workers have protections and where the state government and the federal government are failing to act to provide the protections that workers need um, to, to have a successful work experience, cities and counties are leading and we need to allow that leadership to continue. An example would be on, on paid family leave or earned sick and safe time um, and increasing minimum wage. Right now, Minnesota families are having a very hard time affording their lives. They can't afford the child care that they need, the health care that they need. And so if a business um, is unwilling to provide that on their own and state government and federal government are failing to act, it's up to us to act. And I uh, make no apologies for the fact that we are, uh, my caucus is very committed to moving on paid family leave this session. We are also committed to increasing protections for workers in the workplace uh, dealing with sexual harassment. A person should be able to go to work and do their job and if they are sexually harassed on the job, they should have a remedy. And we are definitely going to be aggressively moving forward on worker protections. Are you comfortable with the rhetoric of urging businesses to move out of a city if they don't, if they enact those Be careful policies? how you describe my words. Forgive me, I, I, that's how I heard it. <laughs> well, let me, let me just say I, uh, I tend to defer to my local government officials back in my district, and I got a lot of them, right? I mean, I've got four counties and I don't know, I'm not even sure how many school districts and city councils and unlimited number of township supervisors and I really tend to defer to them on what's important in, back in their community so that's why I generally tend to fall but let me just one word of caution to cities as they go or, or counties as they go down this road of doing things uh, that they think are in their community's best interest be careful not doing that when you're using the state's money I, I think if the state makes available to local governments grants or loans for different things, uh, uh, I don't think a local government has the authority to then put some strings on that money that to access the state money for a project that uh, you can put other conditions on it. So I think that's a kind of, I've talked to Senator Pratt about that. Some of that is, who chairs the committee with jurisdiction here in the Senate, some of that's starting to happen. And I think uh, unless the legislature gets their arms around that, I think you may see more of that. So I wasn't at that particular meeting, but uh, you know the Senate Republicans formed a new committee, uh, Family Care and Aging, because we care about the issues related to families and, and the struggles that they're going through. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to figure out how do we create a partnership with the private sector, with businesses, more as incentives and rather than mandates, because we think mandates uh, typically are counterproductive in the long run, uh, which is why we tend to push towards uh, uniform labor standards at a state level or, frankly, even at a federal level. Uh, so the more you go down from that, uh, the more concerned I, I get. You know, we're not going to tell businesses what to do, but I can tell you that businesses are looking for certainty and predictability. And if each different town and city and county has a different set of rules that they have to play by, it becomes extremely difficult for them, especially the smaller they are, the more difficult it becomes. And so how do we look towards a, a partnership where businesses feel like their government is working with them to help them successful and help them provide the services that they want to those communities? Senator Gazelka, if I may, if it's okay, jump in on a follow-up because Speaker Hortman brought up sexual harassment in this question and that addressing that at businesses. Can that pass the Senate this year? Are you committed to that? Last session uh, came up right at the very end, and we said that uh, we were open to exploring that, but we didn't feel like it really had the time that it had during last session. Like I said, it was right at the end. It was passed all of our committees in the Senate. So it would not surprise me if something went forward and uh, had bipartisan support and uh, became law. Uh, but the conversation you know, has to start early, and so I believe it will start early. Uh, the language that came out of the, the House, I think, was was much farther than uh, a number of folks wanted in the Senate. Uh, but this is where we get to have the conversation early. I would just state that I think 
municipalities many times take this action because of the failure at the state and local, and on this issue of sexual harassment, or I would say the age of tobacco where we can, because I don't disagree that I think finding uniformity in things. I uh, most often dealt with this as a member of Congress on the Commerce Clause of trying to provide certainty across jurisdictions. Um, but I do recognize that in a time where we're seeing uh, not just failed, broken and shut down federal government, state government that was running to the end in special sessions, that I think for those that make a concern, and I think rightfully they can be of when you have uh, different municipalities with different jurisdictions and different ideas coming up, there, there's certainly a, a recognition uh, that there could be an issue there, but these are local leaders leading because other people weren't. And so they took that upon themselves, they moved forward, they did that. I think we can back them and have this honest discussion about finding some conformity, trying to understand where some of the differences might pose some issues, but trying to come with these, these again, I think collaboration and agreement that uh, in many cases private businesses are leading on paid family leave. The problem is we're leaving some folks behind where the state could go in and, th and that's going to look like, I'm this again, the legislature worked their will, this is going to look like, uh, you know, insurance that's going to be paid in and it's not going to be a cost to the state and businesses are the ones asking for this to happen. So I, it's really interesting. I think all of you who've been reporting for a long time now, it's like we have a, a polar reversal of uh, myself being a federalist and looking more towards local control for doing this. And I'm hearing a lot of times now from my Republican friends saying, well, that's a state or federal issue. Let them deal with that. Um, inside that though, probably lays some ability to compromise because I think both those positions show both sides taking some of the other's view on on maybe how we can find uh, some compromise. So I certainly uh, encourage those leaders to keep pushing the envelope on good governance, on things that reflect, and, and asking us to let's work with them to try and find ways we can provide certainty. Governor. Um, can I follow up? Sorry. I just want on the sexual please, harassment question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Governor, I don't know if I've heard your stance on this and what you would like and what the House bill is looking at by changing the standard. Do you think the state needs to address the current definition of sexual harassment yes, and deal with the severe? I do, and I think case? at this point in time, I think the House version is moving in the direction where the administration is. And um, on the Enbridge issue, two-part question. How soon do you expect that there would be a decision on whether your administration will proceed with the appeal or, or drop it, uh, the appeal of the PUC decision? And second part of the question is, if your Commerce Commissioner recommends that the appeal proceed, what, what are your thoughts on that? And I'd like to get reaction from the other leaders on how quickly this ought to be done. Yes, thank you. And what we do is we, we hope as soon as possible, reviewing what the, uh, what the, <coughs> the petition was that was going forward, uh, what the impact was for us to get a chance to review it. We'll review it out of the Commerce Department. I'll have my general counsel who's simultaneously doing the same things. When they come back and make the recommendation, uh, we will weigh all the evidence and at that time make the make the decision. If it does appear that there's, uh, there's merit in the case, whether it was the uh, the forecast on usage consumption. Uh, if that proves to be valid or there's unanswered questions, um, we'll take a look at that. If it doesn't, then, and then we'll go forward uh, in that direction. But I think now um, I'm asking them to, uh, to have a sense of urgency around this, to get this back to us as soon as possible because there'll be some procedural uh, gates that need to be passed through in this suit as exists right now as it was passed to a new administration. So my answer to you is, is uh, sooner rather than later, and we'll evaluate the merits of it once that data comes to me on based on uh, if there's uh, merit to the, to the suit that was filed or whether we believe that the process as it stands still has the potential to do the things that need to do necessary to follow the science, follow the environmental review process, following the permitting process, and then going forward. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you're not averse to holding this process up, in other words, maybe putting a hold on it or proceeding with the appeal if the data shows that that would be prudent. Is that Yeah, we need to see correct? where it's at. And I think for me, as I'm, I just have to be able to, because this was filed right before we came in, and it's, uh, it's one that we need to see where it was at, why that decision was made. Um, there's, uh, again, following the data, we'll, we'll find out. But I, I just have to know, I can't really comment on it uh, in not understanding what was behind it, where it went forward, but uh, still coming back to it, something I've said time and time again, following that process is really important, providing certainty in it. There, there is always 
the potential in our system, and it's healthy to have judicial review or that capacity to go in if it's warranted. Uh, if it's not, then you continue to move forward. So we are just at an evaluation and a review stage right now. And, uh, and my, my hope is that uh, that uh, you with, with withdraw the, the one agency against the other. Uh, I think businesses are looking for predictability and certainty. I mentioned that. Uh, they followed the process all the way through, and, and then at the end, because it made it through the process, uh, another agency sued. And, I mean, it's one hand suing the other hand. I mean, it's uh, something that we have to figure out. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's mining or, or pipelines or manufacturing. These are the things that we got to follow the process. If they meet all the, the standards, then we let it keep moving forward. And so that, that is my hope, is that you'll take a, a real solid look at it and you know, let the things go that uh, should be done uh, in a timely basis. I mean, PolyMed has been 15 years of permitting. I mean, it's, it's, we have to figure out, and you mentioned this at the chamber yep. dinner, how do we make the process work faster and yet take care of the things that we all hold dear to our hearts here, the environment, our trees, our lakes, the whole uh, environment that we have here. And so I think we can do both, but if we keep throwing wrenches in, it just becomes a, a burden, unnecessary burden for uh, the business, in this case, the pipelines. Could I, could I just get a quick poll, one, two, three, of the, the remaining leaders? Need to do it, don't need to do it, or, or whatever, maybe Senator Bach, if you don't mind. Well, uh, you know, the Public Utilities Commission, uh, they're all Governor Dayton appointees, some Democrats, some Republicans, some confirmed by a Republican Senate, <laughs> some confirmed by a Democratic Senate. They voted unanimously, I believe, if I'm correct, uh, uh, for the certificate of need of this, and I'm pretty perplexed, actually, that in the same administration, uh, the partisan side of it, Commerce then uh, would initiate what they did the end of session. So I would have to see some information that the PUC did not see before I'd say that the suit has merit. Now, I, I, I think we, we all need to trust the work of the PUC. I mean, I don't want those kind of decisions bounced back to a, in a partisan debate at the legislature. That's why the PUC was set up in an independent way that it was. So uh, that's a, unless there's something that they missed, uh, I support the PUC's decision. Speaker Hortman and Leader Dowd, if you don't mind both, too. Well, I agree with uh, Senator Bach in that this is a decision that is currently in the executive branch and the judi judicial branch, and this is not a decision that people should want their state legislature making. The decision should be made on the basis of the hydrology and the evidence that's brought forward uh, by the parties engaged in the e executive branch and the, the uh, judicial branch phase of things. That having been said, I also agree with Senator Gazelka about, uh, you know, that businesses should have certainty and there should be a reasonable timeline for making decisions. So if we step back out of the specifics of a case that's already proceeding under current law as it exists and look at the system in general, you know, I worked with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce on streamlining the environmental permitting process in 2009 and 2010, and we uh, took a lot of steps to make the process as fast as it can be and as predictable as it can be. My background before coming to the legislature was at our family business, John's Auto Parts in Blaine where we ripped apart cars and we dealt with a lot of hazardous substances. So we would have to go to the city and the county and get approval for things that we were doing. And we wanted an answer yes or no as fast as possible. We didn't want the delay itself to be the answer. So I come at this from the perspective of an environmentalist with a small business background. Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no, and the goal is to have the government get that answer as quickly as possible to the businesses involved. But that the process of weighing the evidence is not something that should be done at the legislature. The decision on the pipeline in the mines is an properly in the executive branch and the judicial branch. Would you personally like to see the, uh, the appeal move forward or are you reserving judgment on that? Madam I would Speaker? have to see the, the evidence that the Department of Commerce looked at when they decided to file the appeal. Yeah. Very good. I would very strongly uh, encourage the, the new governor to, to withdraw the appeal uh, or have the Commerce Department withdraw the appeal. I think, you know, this is a project that makes a ton of sense. Um, it's an aging pipeline. Uh, they're going to continue to use that aging pipeline if this new one isn't built. Um, it, we're talking about, you know, a $3 billion private investment in northern Minnesota. It's like building three Viking stadiums. And, and we all thought the Viking stadium was such a great idea, we paid for half of it. Um, imagine three times that. Uh, in northern Minnesota, not to mention the local property tax revenue that this line would 
become the largest property tax payer in, in most of the municipalities that it crosses and, and counties and school districts, um, the, the additional revenue that would come into those uh, would be uh, just awesome for those local communities. Um, and I think we've seen what happens when you uh, do try to bureaucratically throw up enough red tape. Uh, we saw what happened with uh, uh, the Sandpiper Pipeline. Um, you know, I kind of started coin, coined the term that Governor Dayton supported that to death. He kept saying he supported it, but uh, yet we kept seeing roadblocks uh, get thrown up and we actually uncovered some emails through a data practices request where uh, people in, the, in, in his administration were uh, kind of conspiring with, with uh, protesters to, to block the pipeline. Um, those things are concerning. Um, our job, uh, and, and particularly those departments' job, is, is to be, uh, to make sure that the process works, it works on science, it works on, uh, on data, and, and that the right outcome is what we reach. Um, and I think that uh, we have a good process in place, but we've seen some really bad examples. Uh, Polymet taking 14 years and, and three or four hundred million dollars um, is, maybe it's 15 years, I heard you say that, Senator. Um, it's excessive. Um, that's, that's, that's unacceptable uh, to take that long. Um, I think we want to be diligent. We want to do it right. Everyone wants to protect the environment. Um, but at the, at the bottom of this, at the root of this, what you're going to find is that people who are against this just don't want fossil fuels used, and they don't want them coming out of the ground. Um, that seems to be the root. Uh, the reality is uh, every, probably almost every one of us that came here today drove a vehicle that used fossil fuels, and for the foreseeable future, that's going to be the reality. Um, so we can't put our head in the sand and pretend like that's not the reality. Um, and if we hide from uh, that reality, we're going to miss the opportunity to take advantage of all of the jobs and all the economic benefit that comes along with that. And by the way, a pipeline is the safest way to transport oil. Let's do it. Just as you need to fact check the items that are uh, used in federal debate, I think you have to make sure that the things that you hear from the leaders on this panel are always factually accurate. Um, I think that there's a lot more complexity to that story than that's being represented by Leader Doubt. Uh, with regard to Polymet in particular, there have been ownership changes, the international commodities market has been on a <laughs> roller coaster, and the financing of the project itself has not been consistent throughout time. So I think. Things are, it's easy to have sort of a political, turn something into political warfare and lob bombs, but really the factual reality is much more layered in a lot of these situations, and so I think we should be dealing with the facts. Thank you all. I just have a couple of questions uh, as my WCCO TV. Um, the first has to do with distracted driving. We're going to hear from family members later. The speaker mentioned this. Uh, this will be another emotional appeal. I'd like to ask each of the leaders, do they believe that some kind of distracted driving legislation, hands-free, whatever, will pass this session? And the other question I have is on the tax issue. Can you guarantee the increasing number of, of Minnesotans, especially middle class, working class people who file on their own using tax software, will have accurate software that will save them the most possible money that they won't be overpaying? I know the Department of Revenue works with the, you know, these tax providers, but a lot, increasing a lot of people do use this. And from what experts I've talked to have said, you're talking hundreds, maybe even $1,000 or more. I could probably start on the distracted driving. Uh, it was our caucus last year that made a decision not to move forward with that bill, and, and the reality was our caucus was split about half and half on whether to do that. I think that was an issue um, that necessarily, uh, and we see it often here at the Capitol. There are issues that just take time to, to gain the, the, the support um, and the, the mass to, to come to fruition, and I think that one uh, will very likely become law or some progress will be made on it. Some version of that will become law this, this session, I predict that. Um, as far as the, the tax thing, I think that's a great question for uh, the administration, for uh, the revenue department. Yep. Um, have they cooperated and, and do they feel comfortable with all of these turbo taxes of the world? I hate to use a, a specific company as a generic term, but um, all of those companies that do that sort of uh, tax preparation software, um, do they feel comfortable enough? As I said earlier, uh, it, it used to be simple, right? The, the feds would collect all of the data on your itemized uh, return, and then you'd just flip that information over to your state return. The feds aren't going to be collecting that for a large number of Minnesotans now because of the changes at the federal level. Um, so the state will have to collect and, and compile all of that data and have forms that, um, that, that outline that without 
just getting it automatically from the federal return. So I don't know, uh, and I think that's a good question for the administration and for the Revenue Department. Um, ease of filing for Minnesotans is the number one reason that tax conformity is important, <coughs> but not urgent. And the Minnesota Department of Revenue, we're so fortunate uh, that the leadership and the folks who work at the Minnesota Department of Revenue are so good at their jobs. Because, and they told us very clearly last session that if we wanted to do conformity, we needed to do it in time to give them an opportunity to work with all the software manufacturers specifically for the ease of filing for Minnesotans. And we know going into the 2018 filing season, which ends on, well, kind of begins on April 15th, 2019, that the Minnesota Department of Revenue is ready to go. We are not going to disrupt that as the body that controls uh, when and if a tax bill moves. On distracted driving, um, you know, there's really a slaughter on the highways in Minnesota, and you will hear the stories from the families. There was considerable bipartisan support for doing something on distracted driving in the last session, and that's one where I hope we can move rather quickly. I have to say one of the things that uh, the Palenti administration did very well was an effort called Toward Zero Deaths, and it was a collaboration between the Minnesota Department of Transportation, the Department of Public Safety, and uh, other law enforcement agencies. And I would um, encourage Governor Walls to talk to his commissioners of public safety and commissioners of transportation to see what was working uh, when we were really focused in on that Toward Zero Deaths initiative, uh, because we need to do what we can to reduce uh, the carnage on our highways and freeways. Well, I agree. And that program is that's exactly what we are doing. And, uh, and I think, uh, again, I appreciate the leadership up here. They're, they'll, we'll sign a distracted driving bill, I believe, this year if they get it to us. But I, I do think there were some valid points. I think we all agree that uh, it's horrific. Those, we have children, family members out there. I think some of the questions came up with penalties, enforcements, and some of those. And that's what legislators are supposed to do. They're supposed to work out some of those pieces. Um, and it does, as Representative Doubt said, sometimes it's frustrating. It takes a little more time. But I don't think it's because of a lack of focus on this, on safety on the highway, getting this right and understanding what the data shows. As far as the tax providers goes, that's been absolutely clear to, uh, to Commissioner Byerly and the folks at, at Revenue to be prepared, make this as easy as possible. Uh, but I think, you know, the 800-pound the gorilla in the room here is, is I don't think I would be worried about the Minnesota Department of Revenue. I would be worried about the federal department at this point in time of where we're at. Um, but we will do our best. We'll be prepared. The question about working with the third-party providers is exactly right, and we are doing that. Um, our intention is, is that this should be as smooth as possible, um, and that should be the expectation. And I understand now... Um, uh, a, a few weeks back between after the election and before I was sworn in, I was down uh, registering my 79 International Harvester Scout standing in line to get my tabs. And I said, after the 7th of January, you can yell at me for this line, um, but not until then. And the same thing goes with this, that this is our responsibility now to make sure revenue does this correctly. Um, we have given that guidance. We've been clear in my confidence in the commissioner and revenue is, is solid and we'll get this right. Uh, with the uh, Senate Republican leadership uh, of transportation being the author of the distracted driving on the Senate side and the, the Democratic leadership of transportation on the House side, it, I, I believe that you will see it happen. I also believe that you're going to see a number of people both sides of the aisle voting for it, and there's probably some people on both sides of the aisle that won't vote for it. So, And then as far as the... Uh, I'll, we'll work with the administration to see whatever we can do to make the forms and the process related to uh, tax season as good as possible. Well, I, I have to believe the Department of Revenue and the accounting providers in the state are ready. For the, I have heard nothing different. So I, I think uh, the filing season will go smooth. To the governor's point, uh, the IRS is furloughed right now. So how long the shutdown goes on, the president seems to be pretty ambivalent to the impacts. Uh, to people in our country, so if he continues to have that attitude, we're going to have a bigger problem than than, uh, than the Minnesota tax return uh, taxpayers will. On the distracted driving thing, uh, somebody can fact check this because I just heard it and did not. Somebody told me that Ron Dicklich, uh was the first author of a distracted driving bill back in 1988. Uh, I don't know if that's accurate. I remember when I was in the house, Tony Sertich was uh, an author of it back in the probably in the 90s. So anyway, it's been around a long time. Uh, I got an interesting email from uh, a woman from the metropolitan area here last session. And uh, she had lost a daughter to a distracted driving, texting and driving. 
and she'd been here a number of times to testify in support of a, uh, a bill for hands-free. And uh, I don't normally respond back to people who aren't my constituents, but I just couldn't help, help it considering what she had gone through and the frustration she had with the legislatures. And one of, in, in my response back, I wrote, I wish all of these young kids that hate guns so bad would be, feel as strongly about safety on the highways. More young people are killed with distracted driving than are ever killed with guns. And her response back was interesting. She said, they will never give up their phones because they're addicted. And I, I do think we have a good chance to pass something. I think we're, there is some risk uh, on the penalty side. If somebody in, on the floor of the House or Senate decides to get too cute and maybe decide, well, talking on your phone shouldn't be a misdemeanor, it ought to be a gross misdemeanor or it ought to be a felony. Uh, and then kind of with a gotcha vote, <coughs> the bill coming off the floor is really stronger than most of us want it to be uh, because of uh, uh, election gotcha amendments. I think there's some risk if a bill goes to conference committee that it potentially couldn't come out. And legislators will be able to say, well, I voted for it. You know, and, and everybody that voted for it will be able to say they voted for it. And it got to conference and it got bogged down uh, over the penalty provisions. I can just tell you, I, I hope to be able to vote for a bill. I'm not going to vote for a bill that makes talking on your phone or texting on your phone a felony and take away people's rights to vote and all the other things uh, that come along uh, with having a felony on your record. And there's a bill that does that. So I don't know what the penalty provisions are going to look like. But I, I, if I had to bet, I'd say something's probably going to pass. But if people want to play politics with it, it may not. Governor Walls, could we get you to jump in, if I could, on that? What do you want the penalty to be in a distracted driving bill that hits your desk? Is there a threshold that's too high? No, I think this is where I think that the legislature will do their due diligence, because these are good questions to bring up. I understand the passion on both sides. Uh, this is my state representative, Jack Considine, lost his brother to a distracted driver on a cell phone, so Jack and I have been at many conversations. I think for us that I trust what will come out of the legislative process. They think you can feel the, the sense of trying to get to something right here, the goodwill, the values are absolutely shared, and these are very valid and good questions that need to be brought up. I think that's the role of the legislature. I simply ask them to try and get us something that's based on science that we can be enforceable and that can make a difference and improve safety on our roads. Is education a part of this at all? Because Senator Bach brought up the, the letter from, from the woman, you know, that they're addicted, right? Um, is, is, does that need to be part of this as well, education for young people? I see Senator Gazalka, you're nodding your head. Well, I, I would say at some level, education is already there. Um, you know, that they, when, they're, when they get their permit, they, this is an issue that they talk about, but uh, that hasn't been enough to stop it. Uh, and this is an issue that I was not in favor of and now am in favor of because it's, we just have to be able to step in and help people help themselves when they, for whatever reason, can't stop holding their phone. If I could just say this, this, I've looked at this for a long time and on the federal level serving on the Transportation Committee, this is a much more complex issue, both the psychology behind it and the technology behind it. Some of it is about privacy and, and some of those issues, but the other part of it is that there's, there's solid data out there. Just the act of listening to the radio or speaking to someone else in the car also elevates the risk quite significantly. Now, obviously, looking physically down has one thing to do with it, but the act of being focused on this. So it's, it is more complex, but I think, once again, doing something with hands-free, striking a compromise based on science and data may not remove all distracted driving, but if it improves safety on the highway, that's kind of the act that's here. So I, uh, I do think education and letting people know and then, then having a what I think will be a very healthy and robust debate, and I think you heard it here, more than likely something will end up on my desk that, that we will trust the judgment and sign that. But let, let me just say, Bill, I, I do think this bill is going to have to come with an appropriation. It's, it's going to take some money to educate the public on this, and I think when we pass new laws, we have some obligation to do that so that people know what the law is. Every time I cross the bridge going to my cabin in Ontario, there is a huge sign on the wall of a building that says, uh, hands-free cell phones only. You get over the Noden Causeway, and there are the flashing uh, MnDOT-type signs. Every time I go there, you get a constant reminder 
that uh, hands-free cell phones only. So they spend some money on that. I think we're going to have to spend some money on that in order uh, maybe for a few years uh, to get people comfortable with the idea that, because this is a big change for, for most people to not be able to talk on your phone when you're driving. Forget about the texting part, but just physically talking on your phone will be illegal when this happens. So that's a pretty significant change. So I think it'll have to come with an appropriation. I don't want to take it out of MnDOT's budget. They have enough challenges maintaining our roads and bridges. Uh, and I think if the legislature passes a general law, we ought to pay for it and not require the gas tax uh, that should otherwise go to road maintenance to pay for it. Can, can I just jump in, uh, Patricia Lopez with the Star Tribune. Senator Bach, it sounds like you just put up a um, fairly serious obstacle because earlier you said you want to avoid for early wins bills that have spending tails. Uh, everyone seemed to be agreed on distracted driving as a potential early win, but now you're saying that it needs to come with an appropriation and it can't come from uh, MnDOT's funding. So what, what does that do to the prospect for moving this bill out early? Well, it doesn't have to be spending with tails. It can be one-time money, and, and then the legislature revisits that sometime later. Would, you said an appropriation that goes on for several years. Well, but it could be a one-time appropriation. There's a lot of one-time money that just doesn't okay. cancel at the end of the biennium. Mm -hmm. We do that. We oftentimes, especially in grant programs, will make an appropriation and say it doesn't can Normally, appropriations cancel at the end of the biennium. Mm -hmm. This wouldn't have to cancel at the end of the biennium. So would, would it, it necessarily have to come with an appropriation, though? I mean, is there really anybody who doesn't know that you shouldn't look at your cell phone while you're driving? I mean, they do it anyway, but it's not because they don't know that it's not the right thing to do. Well, but it's not against the law. It's against the law to text when you're driving. It's not against the law to talk on your phone. Mm -hmm. This is a significant change, and I just think if we're going to pass that, we we, we got to spend some money telling people uh, that we did it. I'm not trying to get in the way of it. I just think it's the responsibility when you change the law to tell people. Yeah, and Patricia, for clarity, some of the language that I've seen this year is uh, you can talk on your phone if it's attached to the car so it's like a hands-free. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's what I think is going to pass, just for some clarity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I guess uh, changing subjects, uh, Governor Walls, David Gillette from Twin Cities PBS. Yeah. Uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon has uh, thrown his support behind the Restore Your Vote effort this session. Uh, what is your possession on this and what is leadership's inclination to either move or not move with it? Yeah, I fully support that move. I, I have, I think, the, the ability to come back and uh, participate fully in the democracy is one of the keys to reintegration. We know we, uh, we spend an awful lot on incarceration and corrections uh, and in Certainly my opinion, I think we'll have this debate. We, we don't do enough to reduce recidivism rates, and one key piece of that is restoring, I, I think, that, uh, that right to vote, reintegration. It's one piece of a broader package, but I do support it. I absolutely support it, and I hope that it will move in the House uh, rather quickly. You know, when I've been out door knocking ever since I started uh, this gig in 1998, unsuccessfully in the, in the beginning, I would run across people and I would say, I hope I can count on your vote in November. And I would get a number of people every election cycle who say, well, I don't know for sure if uh, I can vote yet, so I'm not going to vote. There shouldn't be this uncertainty for someone who has served their sentence. A felon is, is, is anybody who's committed a crime that's punishable by more than one year in prison. When they get out, we should restore their rights. That way, nobody accidentally commits the felony of voting. It, it puts... Um, um, offenders who have paid their debt to society in a terrible position to not know whether they're legally entitled to vote. So if we have a bright line test, you're in prison and you're a felon, you can't vote. You are out of prison and you are a felon, your right is restored. That, that would be simplest for everyone to deal with. So automatic? So let me just give you my personal position first. Uh, I think we'll have a conversation on it. Uh, but when you get a 15-year sentence, just as an example, typically two-thirds of that is in prison, and then one-third of that is probation. So as I look at it right now, that's still part of the penalty that you got. It was 15 years, but actually five of it was out on probation. So we're going to have a conversation about it, but as I look at it, you know, just me personally as a, a senator, that's kind of how I, I viewed it. Uh, but there is certainly growing momentum around that issue that uh, means we'll have to talk about it. Well, we're, we're, we're the only state in the country that didn't, or the legislature didn't appropriate the federal money that came uh, under the Health, Health of America Vote Act. I mean, that's shameful. I, that $6 million ought to go out the door without much for questions. On the felons voting issue, uh, I actually passed that in the Senate back in 2013 or maybe in 14. I, th I think it's the right, right thing to do. I, 
taking away somebody's right to vote is really serious and, and they were charged with a felony and they've served their time and they're out of prison, I think they should be able to vote. I think it's just a simple, at what point uh, have you paid your debt to society and at what point are your rights restored? And it, it, this right shouldn't be separated from the others. Um, and it's, I think it's a bigger conversation than just voting. Uh, that's been my position all along. And, and uh, you know, if, if the sentences are what Senator Gazelka says where, uh, you know, you haven't completely paid your debt to society, even though you've, you've been released from prison, you still have some debt to pay, at what point do we restore your rights? And it's not just that right. It's a right to own a firearm. It's a right to, you know, whatever it is. Um, we need to look at all of the rights and figure out at what point your rights are restored. With respect to firearms, um, it looks like we've got it, that uh, the bill for uh, restraining orders and for background checks is two thirds of the way there. We've got uh, Speaker Hartman, we've got the governor backing these things. What would you say to Senator Gazelka to urge him to vote for these things? And uh, Representative Doubt, I presume that you oppose those. What would you say to him to urge him to oppose these pieces of legislation? Yes, you do. The question was to us, what, what yeah. are we going to say? Yeah, to the supporters, what do you, would you say to, to, to advise them to, 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 to support to uh, reasonable common sense gun violence prevention uh, bills? I think that Minnesotans have been very loud and clear in asking for this. And I, ha I think that as an American in society today, you have to look at the carnage that happened in Sandy Hook, in Las Vegas, in churches, in restaurants, on college campuses. And at a certain point, you have to say to yourself, honestly, in the United States of America, we don't have a school safety problem. We have a gun violence problem. And if we have a gun violence problem, then we have to do something to address that problem. Uh, the other thing I would say is the political reality is this, this issue has moved. You know, we, all of us, have served uh, long enough or been around politics long enough to see public opinion change rapidly on certain topics. Public opinion changed rapidly on same-sex marriage. It has changed rapidly on the issue of marijuana. And it has changed rapidly on the issue of gun violence prevention. And Parkland was literally the last straw for, for a lot of Americans, and in particular, really active uh, parents and com uh, concerned community members who are willing to not only come to the state capitol and sit in a protest, but to go door knocking in their neighborhood and to go to a forum at their church and to convince their neighbors that this is something that should determine their vote in the next election. Kurt, what do you want to tell me? <laughs> you know, I think it, it, it's, an, it's obviously everybody uh, is concerned about making sure that we reduce these sorts of, of incidences. Everybody wants that. Um, I would take Melissa's statement one step further and say it's actually a mental health crisis that we have. Um, and in other parts of the, of the world, uh, you see people driving a big truck into a crowd of people or taking a knife to people. Um, and the reality is uh, we, we need to figure out why people want to hurt other people. Um, and, and get to the bottom of that. We've, we, we have a mental health crisis in this state. Um, we have people who are being checked into emergency rooms on mental health holds for more than 100 days at a time. And, a, and an emergency room is the least effective, most expensive place to treat someone with a, a mental health issue. You know, I got an email from somebody, and I kind of forgotten about this, but in, in Cambridge, Minnesota, we have a facility um, 20 to 30 beds that's sitting empty, that the state owns, that we literally are paying state employees to maintain. Um, and, 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 and we don't have enough mental health beds. Uh, you know, we, I think we need to approach it from, from that front. We do have in this state some of the strongest uh, gun safety laws in the entire country. We, we made some changes when we had the, the shooting in uh, Recorey some years ago. Um, and, and we, do, we also have a rich tradition of gun ownership and, and uh, a rich t sporting tradition here in the state of Minnesota. Um, and I think people, there is a, a, a balance between uh, giving people the access to the, to the sporting firearms and, and access to their, you know, fully appreciate their Second Amendment rights um, and not infringing on those rights. So, uh, you know, I think we want to do what we can to keep people safe and keep hands out of the guns, or excuse me, keep guns out of the hands of, of dangerous criminals. Everybody wants that. Um, and if there's a way to figure out how to do that, I'll be part of the solution. So I listened to their advice. Uh, I can see that we're 
were split. Uh, what I will tell you that I've had a conversation with uh, Senator Warren Limmer of Judiciary, and he wants to have a, a comprehensive overview of guns. So not uh, not just gun laws or future gun laws, uh, but also the benefits of those that uh, uh, own gun shops and the benefits of those that like to hunt, 500,000 deer hunters, that, and many of them have a semi-automatic semi rifle that some people might want to ban. And so there's, it's, it's, it's complex. Uh, so that's part of what we'll do this year. Uh, last year we had uh, some unfinished business that I think we can do. We, we passed uh, $25 million of safe school money, uh, which went to making the school buildings safer, but also mental health resources. Uh, we put it in three different bills. One of those bills got signed. Uh, but I talked to some folks from Education Minnesota just within the last two weeks, and they said that there was over $200 million of demands for safe schools. And so that's a, a potential area that we could use one-time money. So point is, uh, there, it, there's going to be robust discussion without a doubt. Uh, I know that there are certain things that I will be able to get done. Those are the ones that I'm going to put most of my energy on, and then we'll see on the other sides of it. I, personally, as a, a gun owner, I, you know, I don't think that we need more expansion, but uh, there are many people that do, and so that's where we're going to have an interesting debate uh, going forward. But at the very minimum, I think we can focus on safe school money. We can focus on mental health resources, uh, which I think we all agree would be beneficial. Well, I think the experience you see federally, uh, after Sandy Hook, I think everyone thought something was going to happen. After Las Vegas, everyone thought something was going to happen. After, uh, after Parkland, everyone thought something was going to happen. Uh, and the only thing that happened was the governor or the president recently signed something on bump stocks executively. Nothing ever got seriously considered by the Congress. Uh, I have always thought that you should have to get a background check when you buy a gun at a retail establishment. And uh, you do. If you, you go do. to a licensed firearm dealer, yep, uh, whether do. it's my Virginia Enjoy surplus it. where I buy uh, uh, guns up north or a Gander Mountain or a Cabela's, you've got to get a background check before you can leave with the gun. I've never understood why if there's a retail gun show at a community building or a gymnasium, they actually might hold them there in rural Minnesota, some public event that's advertised with posters uh, where people are coming and retailing guns to the public. I've never understood why who's ever putting that show on can't hire uh, somebody at the door that says, okay, yeah, you bought a gun, okay, you've got to get a background check before you can go out the door. I, I've never understood why we can't do that. I, I think the gun show thing is something that could be resolved. Where you lose me is you, when you tell me that I can't sell my shotgun to my neighbor who has lived with me my entire life. We have lived next door to each other. And you tell me, oh, he's got to go down to the county sheriff's office and get a background check before I can sell a gun to Irv or to Gary. That's where you, and I think that's where you lose most gun owners. And I think that's what's not, not well representative in the polling that you see that everyone hangs their hat on. I, I think the assumptions are, they're talking about retail background checks. I think the assumptions in the polling is not you can't sell your gun to your neighbor, you can't give a gun to your son, right? I mean, and I realize the, the bill in Minnesota exempts, last year at least, exempted family member transactions, but uh, it's a difficult issue, been around a long time, uh, not based on what I see federally. I don't know if anything will happen or not. I think it's up to the two leaders to decide, I guess, whether something passes, but I can just tell you this. I had 39 Democrats in the Senate in 2013, and we we couldn't get a couldn't we knew we couldn't, so we didn't even try pass something uh, in 2013 and 14. So anybody that thinks you can pass something with 33 Democrats in the Senate, you'll need a lot of help from uh, Senator Gazelka. Just put the cards out there where they are. Senator, may I just jump in here because Governor Walls alluded to what you were talking about, which is you know, passing the firearm on to a grandson or, or something like that, okay? But you're also talking about tighter restrictions on, on retail sales, specifically gun shows. Governor Walls, is that kind of a minimum as far as you're concerned of what needs to be done, of what, of what you would support as governor? I'm talking about the retail loophole. 
Governor, yes. if you could answer that really briefly. Yeah, we go. know you all have to get somewhere right now, so we want to yeah. cut off right after Apologize. that. You're going to cut me off from answering a gun question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. Uh, I think it's pretty. Saved by the bell. I think it's no. It's pretty obvious on this that I, I set at the center of this as much as anyone. Uh, I would have to echo Speaker Hortman's uh, sentiments that society changes rapidly, and there's expectations that we we adjust to that. Uh, if you want to know. What I saw a lot about there, a lot of these suburban votes were, were predicated on this issue of safety, a, a large piece of them. Safety, health care, and education, and, and gun safety wrapped up into that. Uh, I understand, and I think there's not as much difference as you hear on a very volatile issue. And, and there's four folks up here were talking pretty candidly about this, of trying to strike what is the age-old question, striking the constitutional and personal freedoms versus societal safety pieces on that. And when you look at the research, we're not going to reduce all of them, no, but things like red flags laws and gun show loopholes do have the potential to reduce some of those. And what I think they do more of is they show us that we can work together to listen to each other's side on this and strike some proper balances because this issue, and, and again, this is actually very core. Uh, I have the last firearm I bought, I did an FFL, took them 11 minutes or whatever, and they come back with this. I also have uh, my wife's grandfather's M1 that he bought after coming back from World War II that he just gave to me. And striking that in our culture and in the safety and what that means it is a fairly complex issue, but I don't think these are intractable. I do reject the notion that we can't do things to make things safer. I reject the notion that of all the nations in the world, this is just inherently here, that we do a worse job of it than any place else. We can do better than that in trying to strike that balance. So my expectations are that we have a robust, honest debate. I would like to see uh, those two pieces of legislation that have been suggested move forward with the safeguards and the debate and the compromises necessary to make them do as much as possible what they're supposed to do without infringing on those rights. If that happens, I think we can get it done. I want to be really clear for those of you who are writing gun, sto gun stories. There is no such thing as a gun show loophole. Uh, the dealers that come to a gun show and sell guns have federal firearms licenses and they do background checks on those purchases. I know. I participate in this. I uh, was at three gun shows last year myself. Um, and I think it's really important. Is it possible for a member of the public to show up at a gun show and sell a gun to another member of the public? Yes. But the gun show has nothing to do with that relationship. Um, the people who are, if you sell more than three guns in a year, you're required to have a federal firearms license um, and you're required to do background checks on the people that you sell your guns to. Um, so I think we just need to be really clear about that. There really is no such thing as a gun show loophole and guns that are sold at gun shows are subject to background checks. Okay, can I well, buy one at a gun show without a background check? From an individual, you can. So you can also buy it outside of the purchasing of a firearm at a gun show without a background check. You can also purchase that firearm from that individual outside of a gun show. The gun show has nothing to do with it. If you purchase a gun show from somebody who is... Are you advocating expanding that further then outside the gun show if that's... No, our, our caucus actually brought a bill last year uh, that would have offered... Uh, liability protections to someone who went and got a background check on a private party sale. And I think that incentive, it's the carrot instead of the stick that we talked about. Um, if you're selling one, to, to Tom Bach's point, if you're selling one private party to somebody that you know, somebody in your hunting party, a family member, I mean, somebody that's been in your hunting party for 20 years, um, I don't think a background check should be required on that. Um, but everyone has the ability to go to their local law enforcement right now on a private party sale and get a background check. Um, those, that service is available to any Minnesotan right now, and I think it's good practice. I don't think people should transfer firearms to people that they don't know without a background check ever, period. There, there is go. a loophole. Okay. Okay. And you would agree with that, Governor, I would assume, that nobody should transfer a firearm to somebody they don't know without a background check? Yeah, that's correct. But I, I think okay. there's, there's some good starting places here that you heard. and Nobody is under any illusion that this is an easy one. Um, but I do think the spirit of trying to tackle them, and it's something that was made very clear to me, this is a rapidly changing societal issue um, that the expectation in Minnesota is for us to uh, certainly have the debate as a minimum, and I think the expectation is to get something done. Well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. I know I've kept you longer than I said I would, so thank you all for being here. Thanks for having this conversation with us, and have a wonderful session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you all.